staff member at a Maori public health unit. <laughs> well, these are 39 cents tax. Could be earning over 180,000. Won't be affecting me, eh? Won't be affecting me either. So it's going to come. Yep. I quite happily increase my income to that a little bit more. <laughs> yes, I haven't had that experience. Combine all our incomes together and we're not anywhere near it. Thank you, Chair Key. So it's my pleasure to introduce you today to Lou Evans, who has the coolest job title of um, Chief Activator at uh, Coin South. And so she's going to um, tell you quite a lot about what they're doing. And Coin South is a stakeholder that uh, we work with at Council um, at, out in our communities. So over to you, Lou. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for having me here today. Um, if I don't speak loud enough, please let me know. <laughs> Um, so Coin South has just celebrated our first year anniversary, which is really exciting. Um, but that doesn't mean much if you don't know who we are. So um, oops, how can I do this? Ah, where am I supposed to be clicking at? Anybody? No. Sorry. You just click if you like. <laughs> yeah. So um, first I want to start with an elevator pitch uh, and we make all our, our small businesses do an elevator pitch. So I figured I should share you as. Um, but quickly an elevator pitch is simply a 30 second pitch on who you are, why you should be in the room um and what makes you interesting so if you click to the next slide then i'll actually be able to read it um so coin south is an innovation network uh, for south and startups looking to scale beyond the region uh, we have an incredible network of mentors industry experts alumni um, and coaches and a can-do attitude we're focused on coaching teams using an investment lens um, to ensure we su support successful, profitable and sustainable businesses and connect those startups with the right people, skills and funding opportunities that they need to grow. Um, as is a bottom up approach. So if you know your bottom line from the bottom of the world, then everything from there is up. So this is an aspirational pitch. Uh, we don't yet have a huge number of alumni, but we plan on it. We don't have a huge number of mentors, but we are growing that network. Um, and like I say, we, we've been here for a year now, and so that human library of ours is growing and growing and growing. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, maybe another one. So I had KPIs in the in my first week at Coin, well not my first week. When I got to Coin, I had KPIs of finding ten startups in Southland, um, with a stretch of maybe seeing twenty, and we've had one hundred and seventy four founders come through coin doors since April 27 last year, uh, which is insane. Uh, it's one every two days. Um, and these ideas could be anything from, I want to start a market garden to I have built a piece of machinery that I think could help a lot of farmers in Southland to I've started um, my MVP, my minimum viable product for a piece of tech 
that I think is going to disrupt the way that uh, financial services work. So it's a, a really broad spectrum. Um, and as this year has progressed, we've seen everyone on that, that scale and are starting to put things in place to, to streamline it a bit and, and work on specific groups. Uh, slide, please. So our youngest is 16. Um, we work with the Young Enterprise Scheme and one of the girls from one of the groups there has come through COIN in her own right and she's making a new cookie um, that is healthy and is um, a snack that feels like you're being indulgent but you're not, which is quite cool. Um, the packaging's amazing and uh, she's doing incredibly well. Uh, next slide is our oldest, uh, is 82, and he handcrafts his own um, eco bikes uh, in, in town. So he, he builds by hand these um, four wheel, you may have seen them around, these four wheel uh, sit down cycles. Um, he made them because his, his wife had a hip problem, um, but is selling those as well. So he comes along to all our pitch events and, um, and things. So innovation definitely looks different in Southland. Um, next slide, please. We have people from everywhere in Southland. So uh, we have Chris from Lumsden. He's making, um, from Gathered Game, you may have heard of him. He's amazing. He's making um, jerky um, from Wild Game and is going gangbusters. Julie from Muju in um, Toto, she is making paneer cheese from um, fresh milk and she's the only one in Australasia <laughs> doing it that way. So she's found a, a very niche market and is doing incredibly well too. Uh, Nate, I'd be surprised if you haven't heard of him, uh, from Gravity Fishing and Bluff, uh, keeps winning ridiculous amounts of awards and uh, fishes line to hook. What's really great about Nate though is he doesn't have one idea, he has multitude of ideas and he keeps coming in and my phone doesn't stop ringing with Nate. Um, I've become his PA, perhaps. Um, Rekiura, in Rekiura is uh, creating a whole manner of things, um, but when I went over there as part of um, Future Rekiura, I got to meet a huge amount of people creating little ideas on the island and if we want to scale beyond the island and scale beyond the region as well. Uh, Rekiura wants to make salt from Stewart Island um, and ship up the country as both a, a souvenir and a food substance. Um, Ricky from Winton is creating multi-sport competitive kayaks and the reason he's come to us is he is innovating the way he can hold a watch on the boat because currently they tape it or they uh, use suction cups and it falls in the water um, and they need the watch to be able to see the cadence of their strokes. Um, so he has designed and created an inset watch holder um, and has come through our uh, innovation fund. Josie from Gore has just been awarded second place in Soda Inc, which is a, a seed grant in Hamilton. Um, and she creates pickled uh, pickles, pickled onions and preserves. And Soda have described her as the Pix peanut butter of pickles and preserves. They think she's gonna go gangbusters as well, which is really cool. And Leiden in Balclutha, kind of skipping into the Otago region there, but uh, Leiden is working on a piece of tech uh, called Mecom, which is a, um, a messenger bot that means that small businesses no longer have to have a website or take photos of all their products. They can simply sell and um, uh, get orders directly on Facebook Messenger and nothing else. Um, makes it really simple, makes it super cheap. Um, and yeah, a small, small niche, but plenty of people in that space. So that's really exciting too. Uh, next slide, please. So we have three main groups of people. We've got the tinkerers. Um, from left to right, we've got John Dillon making hydraulic relief valves. Um, Claire from Better by Bar, she makes these soap holders that stop the scum from your soap sitting in your shower. Brian is making a fishing gimbal that helps stop fishing fatigue and you can um, lift the, the weight off the bottom of the water if you're a kid, um, but if you're an experienced fisherman it helps uh, you do it all day, which is really exciting. This is not yet in production, but he got an innovation grant and he is determined to see it in all of your Christmas stockings, um, at least by next year. He's hoping this year. 
Uh, Ethan on the right makes bipods for guns. So they're the little things that keep it standing, I guess. Um, and what's great about his is they are silent um, to take on and off. So you don't um, freak the, the deer out. Um, they're super lightweight and um, yeah, it's just easy to use mostly. Uh, the next slide is for food. So like I said earlier, Josie on the left, Julie from the paneer in the middle and Nate on the right for um, uh, gravity fishing. We have a lot of food producers come through Coin South um, and that's simply because there are a huge amount of farmers in Southland and they all are looking for different ways to diversify uh, their income. Uh, the next slide, uh, we even have tech. So like I said, we've got Leiden and, and Valclutha, but we also have um, a woman from Bluff who is creating a grassroots fund fundraising piece of tech that allows uh, fundraisers not to have to hustle quite so much. Um, they can simply just push out a link and all the payments done in one place. Uh, we've got a guy who's creating a thing called Squad, which is kind of like Afterpay. Um, too big to explain quickly, but uh, we do have tech here in the region, which is really exciting. We don't have a huge amount of tech infrastructure or people that can actually help build the thing. So one of my biggest jobs in the tech space is collecting a human library of people all over New Zealand. And um, one of the best things about COVID means uh, we actually already have, have got those connections um, and it's quite easy to get in touch with people. So that's really cool. Uh, next slide. So a network, we have five strategic partners um, at the top. So Community Trust, Environment Southland, Southland Chamber of Commerce, Notahu and SIT. We also have another 12 um, corporate members uh, who help us with a little bit of funding. We work really, really closely with Startup Dunedin and Startup Queenstown Lakes to the point we have also created an angel investment network within those regions as well called Mainland Angels. Um, and the three of us are on Slack every day talking about uh, barriers we're facing, sharing resources. We don't create things from scratch if one of the others have got it, we uh, share everything. And that's really unusual for um, a startup network, but the rest of the country have seen how well we're working together and they're going, wait, we want in too. So we're also now working with Creative HQ and Soda Inc and um, a variety of other networks around the country too. We work really closely with Great South, our EDA um, and tribal economies through Naitahu. Um, and we get some funding from Callahan Innovation as well. Uh, next slide. So uh, if someone comes to see me, this is kind of what they go through. I, I figured this would be helpful. Um, so they, they come to me through call or referral or whatever. Um, we sit and do an activator session, which is a panel of three of us, either two from COIN or one from COIN, one from Punapaki and one from Great South sitting together and discussing their idea. It's, it's really simple, two, two main questions. Where are you at with your idea and what's stopping you from reaching high growth? Um, and from there, you generally get out pretty much all their story um, and how they got there and what they want to do and their life goals and everything. Um, and we can figure out next steps and use our networks between the three of us to, to figure out how we can connect them with the right skills, funding um, and people they need to, to grow. Um, that fear less thing in the middle is a folder um, and everyone gets a folder. It's got a lean canvas in it or a coin canvas that we've, we've changed a little bit. And basically that's a one page business plan. Um, and we take every startup or every business that comes to see us through one of those. So every single person that comes through Coin South leaves with value. They've got a business plan when they walk out, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we've got these four courses that uh, we can then triage each of the founders into. Startup Light is free, it's online, it can be used anywhere by anyone. Um, it's a step-by-step -step through the startup journey, everything from how to name your idea, how to do your finances, how to find your break even, how to talk to a lawyer, when to talk to a lawyer, um, everything, uh, how to, every, yeah, everything. Start It is a paid for version of that and that includes accountability. Um, we haven't started running this yet. That will start in 2021. Um, and so it's not a huge figure on this. It's simply to, to gate it to make sure people see value in actually putting their business first. Um, so they come through, we do roadmaps with them, set expectations and figure out what they want to achieve within three months. Then 
either of those two can go through, it, through to a popcorn pitch, which we ran recently. A popcorn pitch is simply stand up for a minute, share your idea and then ask what something that you want to get from the audience that you're in front of. And then we also host fireside chats, which are um, talks with alumni, people who have already gone through the journey. On the more advanced side of the, the spectrum, we've got prove it and nail it. Prove it is if you've got a product and you need to prove that it works with your customers. So it's um, validating the idea, making it perfect before you scale. Um, and nail it is a really true startup. So someone who has a team, it's an innovative, disruptive idea that is definitely going to grow far beyond the region um, and we put wraparound support for them in there so a coach um, we've got a little bit of funding there to be able to help support them with other things they need if they need to flights to get somewhere if they need a photographer to help them sort their product out better whatever it is we can help them they get a showcase um, often it's with found decks and then the idea is to push them through to investment ready to my which is that final step which is that mainland angel investment network we have not had anyone through there yet, but hopefully this year. Uh, cool, next slide. That's the same thing in words. I'm not gonna read that one. Um, next slide, sorry. So uh, Karen asked me to talk about when I went over to Stuart Island and I think it was a really great opportunity for COIN to showcase that um, ideas can come from absolutely anywhere and everyone has an idea. Uh, so we hosted this From Idea to Reality workshop um, in the fire station and it didn't have a huge amount of attendance which simply is due to uh, netball is on a Thursday night and that's where everyone was. Because we were in town on a Sunday. Exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. So instead I went to the pub on the Friday and sat in the pub all day on Friday and people came to me with their ideas. So we had hosted an activator session there. So we had... Uh, maybe 20 people come and have a chat, which was really cool. Um, some of them were simply, I don't know if I've got an idea, but I want to have a chat and that's cool. Um, maybe I want to be an entrepreneur one day. And some of them were existing tourism businesses that are really feeling the pinch down there. Um, and were looking for help in marketing space or in diversifying whatever it is that they were making and, and figuring out what's next. And some of them were true startup ideas. So Racky or Salt was really cool. There's a guy down there who's um, keen to grow native mushrooms which would be amazing um there's oh there's all manner of things uh, so it's really exciting to see and they were all very positive for us returning um so i'm, I'm down for that um the next slide please uh maybe keep clicking because you might get some more images hopefully all right well there's a bunch of images on here um Basically, these slides are about uh, to show you that we do a whole bunch of different events. We house uh, we house in-house events like Morning Mahi, which is basically teaching 101 marketing, 101 pitching, 101 finances, all the things that you need as a, a startup. And we also jump on board other people's events in Otago and in um, Queenstown Lakes as well um, and support SIT and the young enterprise students. Um, anywhere that innovation pops up, we would love to be. We went out to field days. Um, there were a huge amount of innovative ideas out of field days, and so we'll definitely be doing that again. Um, really keen to, to continue this, this outreach. Um, so we've been out to Boar for an activator session um, and sat in a cafe there and had a huge amount of people come through uh, with new ideas and mostly food or manufacturing, so uh, farm, uh, gadgets which was fun um i haven't been on a farm so well i have been on a farm but i haven't i don't know anything about the farm um so half of the chat was explained to me what the thing was but we get there in the end um the good thing is i know a whole lot about marketing and they don't seem to so we find it a middle ground um yeah next slide please one of the really cool things about coin is we have an innovation fund so that's come from the chamber of commerce um it was a manufacturer's trust money. There's a little bit of cash there that allows us to help people who are looking to prototype a new um, thing, a widget of some description, um, and they can get up to $5,000 in matched funding. We've had three successful applicants so far. Ethan is the one with the bipod. Uh, Brian is the one with the fishing gimbal, so he's got his MVP started so he can figure out costs and then go to full production. 
and Ricky, the guy who makes the watches, or the watch holders in Winton is, is the third. Um, we've had, we've got another two sitting on the books at the moment, ready to, to come through. Um, and this is without advertising the innovation fund as well. So I imagine that there are a whole bunch of these. Um, we work with Fire Innovations. Uh, they come in and pull the idea apart, make sure it's actually sound. Um, we work with Great South, Chamber of Commerce and the, their respective boards as well. So that's quite cool. Next slide, please. That's it, really. I just wanted to see if you had any questions for us. It's a huge amount of people come through and all manner of ideas. So um, we kind of see everything and are keen to work with everybody. Um, but yeah. Thank you very much. I would say so. I would say so. So this, I presume you saw seeding funding for some of these to get off the ground, is that uh, it, so we don't have seed advice. funds to give them. We um, connect them with people who could. So uh, we definitely work with people like Soda who have a seed fund. We're hoping to have a seed fund. Uh, <laughs> that's next step. Because um, there's definitely a barrier between friends and family money and investment money. Yeah. Um, and quite often that's the barrier that will we'll tell whether or not someone's going to go ahead with it. Sometimes they just need a bit of a boost. So with Josie from... Um, uh, Robbie's Pickles and Onions, um, Pickles and Preserves, sorry, she almost lost everything in, in COVID because um, most of her, her sales come through markets and plates and things like that. Um, and she has been sitting on, on a domain name for the last three years and was too scared to do anything because she wasn't sure that she'd get it right. So we just kind of took it off her hands, put, it, put her online overnight, um, got her sales up, and now she's selling 70% of her product to Auckland and Wellington. So while we don't have seed funding, we do have the ability to get stuck in, I guess. Yeah. She makes mm. pretty good hot plate pickled onions in one time. Yeah. <laughs> she does, yeah. <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. Drew, you talked about um, the prototype for a new idea, but obviously like pick pickles and onions and bits and pieces like that, I mean, they're out in the... Um, when we can all go out and buy them in the supermarket, how do you identify a business that you're going to follow through with? Or why was her idea so innovative that you decided to go with it? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. We have, um, I did not expect Josie to be someone like that, to be honest. When I first met her, and she was one of the very first people that came through Coin, I expected her to stay as a hobbyist in a market. Um, but honestly, her coachability was the thing that was that stood out. Um, we give everyone homework and if they come back, we'll help them to the next step, whatever that next step is. And whether that's just pushing them online or to an accountant to do that cash flow forecasting, whatever. Josie kept coming back um, and she did all her homework and she truly takes on everything you say, curates the bits she likes and drives her business in that direction. And she has become a startup. She definitely wasn't to begin with. So I'm not there to gatekeep what is a good idea or not but um coachability for sure um ambition and if they're keen to to grow outside the region we'll definitely support that as well so it doesn't have to be something really innovative new out there thank you um, i also love the question you've got from joel yeah it's great it's a good job <laughs> it's a great job silly title but great job. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a pitch about Bitcoin. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. We do get a lot of people come in actually selling vintage coins. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a fun one. Oh, no. Cool. It's great to see that um, collaboration with within, within the region and um, certainly be good for both um, South and Asia. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Well, it's particularly exciting to hear that farmers or a lot of farmers are working to diversify Absolutely. their offerings. And, yeah. And, um, I see great examples that a food strategy yes. they're working on. And, yes. Yeah, 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Councillors. Um, so the purpose of this report is for the committee to consider the draft significance and engagement policy and provide feedback. Um, it's proposed that the committee recommend to council that it endorse the, the draft policy for public consultation. Um, so council is required to have this policy and it has a two part function. The first is that it provides the methodology by which the degree of significance attached to a particular matter is assessed. And then the second part of the policy outlines how and when council will engage with the community. So regarding that first step, how to assess significance, um, some changes were made in this section as you'll see in the redacted version to clarify the factors to consider when assessing significance. So in practice, this assessment is the go-to in order to determine the significance of a particular issue that council is considering. Um, so as you're aware, every report that comes to committee and council assesses significance. So this policy is really the backdrop to that. This section of the policy also lists, as is required by the LGA, what council's strategic assets are. So that the definition is somewhat fraught, but the effect of being a strategic asset is that a decision to transfer ownership or control must be provided for in the LTP. So currently in the draft policy, the list of strategic asset reads the roading and bridge network as a whole, um, three waters, plants and reticulation networks, reserves, CASA, the Tiano Airport at Manapuri, and community housing as a whole. So, so that list, as it stands, takes both the definition, which I said we can get into, but it is relatively um, complex, as well as what I've just noted, that there's a requirement that the sale or transfer of these would need to be done through the LTP framework. Um, so we can discuss that in more detail if there's any questions, um, but there, there hasn't been any changes made to that as yet. And as you'll see in the report, paragraph 12 lists the other minor changes that have been made. So the next steps um, after this committee is that changes requested will be incorporated into the draft and then it will be presented to council at its October meeting to approve for public consultation from the 4th of November to 4th of December. And submissions would be presented to council early 2021, followed by deliberations and adoption. Um, so it, it's, it's a really interesting policy and I'm happy to discuss any aspects of it before turning to the recommendations. And Louise, do you have anything to add or would I just summarize? No, <laughs> Thank you very much. I've provided, I've provided concerns about the name because engagement is not what it's about, which is 
Um, yes, it is. Three years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just got a question around page 35 of the draft, because I didn't look at the current one, considering considering the draft. Um, it's just, for clarification, you've got the fun, um, one of the factors are of equal weight. It talks about the financial and non-financial costs and implications of the issue decisional proposal having regard to the capacity of the council to, there's a typo there, it should be performance role. Um, is that indicating the, um, if there's assessment that the council hasn't got the capacity, that that's when you go out for consultation or, or so the other way around? Well, through you, Madam Chair, I would take that the factors, this, this is the first significance test. Yeah. And so the actual form of engagement um, would come after the assessment of significance. So. Yes, but you're, if you're testing the significance of it, does it mean that it becomes more significant because council hasn't got the capacity as to pose if it has the capacity? I'm not making myself very clear, but it's um, it, it's suggesting the the capacity of council to perform its role is one of the factors, weighting factors. The greater the cumulative impact of the matter as assessed by the factors, the more more significant the issue. So does the fact that there's no capacity in council mean the issue is more significant? Um, through you, Madam Chair, I suppose that would depend on the issue. Um, that, that you're looking at, if it, if it relates to um, council's ability to provide um, adequate drinking water and it doesn't have the capacity, that, that's going to be a very significant issue. But regarding this whole list, they do all have to be weighed together. It's not Yeah, I'm isolated. not suggesting it's not. I'm just trying to understand what that says. Yeah. So you're, what, no, you're, it just, what you just said, point. if it doesn't I have mean, capacity, it's then more significant. I guess I would go back to my initial my initial response, is, is that I think it would depend on the specific issue. The capacity to do it will affect, yeah, depending on that issue, capacity or not. That relates to the issue itself. Yeah. Okay. And just a second question. Um, you talk there about we determine the significance of a matter um, that could have a high level of significance. It is recommended that council staff discuss the importance of a matter with our iwi partners. Uh, can you just let me know why it's a should rather than a will in that sentence? Sorry, yes. Sorry, it's just, it's just no, about three no, lines I mean, down. It, it says. It is recommended that council are oh, over there on that one. Um, so, so oh, just, sorry, I read a should into that, but it, it's, say, it's, it just says it is recommended. It is recommended, council, I guess, yeah. but would we not just do it when it's very significant or when it is significant? Um, we will when we have the um, the when we ensure that um, our partners have the capacity to be able to do that. There will be some things um, we can't, they don't have the capacity to do every single thing. So we'll have the conversation with them. Um, yeah, so we'll have the conversation the and they will determine yes. their yeah. level. So yeah. it is it is a will in a, in a yeah. way. Okay, All right, thank you. Can I include an I think it is, it is significant it becomes a matter of significance if we can't afford it. Right. That, that's how I would interpret that. Right, thank you. Because if we can afford it, then to me it's not significant. Not as a significant. Yes. It only becomes a matter of significance if, through the matter of whatever reason, we can't afford it. Yes. But I think that's what that Yes, means. yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, through you, Madam Chair, is there 
different wording on the second point that you think would better reflect the arrangement or are you? Well, if I guess I'm asking the question and it may be worthwhile just having a look to see if it can be worded a little bit differently. Yeah, not that I've got the answer right now because I didn't give that some thought. Yeah, I was, no, no, oh, no, I'm, I'm here yeah. seeking feedback, so I'd like to get on. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Can um, so, again, again, for that one, Kerry, um, would it council need you from the Iwi perspective? It is recommended that council staff will discuss the importance of the matter at the beginning part of the meeting. Yes, well, I guess if it, why is it only a recommendation? Why is it? Who does the recommendation go to? The staff. It's recommended from staff that they do that or not. But yeah, so, so right. I think As opposed to staff uh, will yeah. do this. Yes. Yeah. It's still recommended that they will do it. But, but that's, the, that's the clarification. I well, I guess my question is why is it only recommend a, rec recommended? Why is it not just done? Okay, so the alternative would be to determine the significance of the matter. Yeah. For me, that's about the partnership. That's really clear. Is that answer that guarantee? Yeah. That's exactly the information I'm seeking. Yeah. Whether yeah. councillors are, are happier with that wording. So I think we take on with it, take out. We will get to put our councillors to all the consultation. Take out that um, that is recommended that they just council staff. Mm. And what if Ely says no? They've had a choice. Mm. It means we're not determining the capacity of Ewe to respond to that matter of significance. We've provided the information and they have a choice. Mm. Bike trail network, or is that the Sorry, I missed the first part of that. Bike trail, bike trail, customer Sorry about what? Would you, what's your question about the bike trail? Oh, well, I wonder if that's a strategic asset, just that it costs a few million dollars. Yeah. 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 So I think to you, yeah, um, it's recognised as a as part of the transport activity, so the roading network. So because we're talking here about roading bridge network as a whole, I think it covers it. Cover it with that first point. Mm -hmm. So this is going out for public consultation as well. Yeah. I just wonder, I mean, this is probably my lack of knowledge, but under remaining flexible on page 39, it's important the council does not use a homogeneous approach. Well, I don't even know what homogeneous means. That one there. Same, same approach. It means a one... Um, one size fits all. One size fits all, yeah. Right. So definitely can change that to one size. Well, just because I don't know, yeah. I don't know, I just meant to say the rest of the world's that number. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 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 I wasn't there the year they were teaching that. <laughs> yeah, just coming back to some comment, I agree that it would be worth specifically mentioning the cycle trail because it's not clear to that that's part of the roading bridge network as a strategic asset. So yeah. if that wording could be included, including cycle trails. Um, um, so it's on page page 36 under the list of what's what consists of a strategic asset. So through, the, through the chair, I can confirm that the round and mountain cycle trail is part of the roading yeah, but in terms of like having it in this document that's going to go out for public consultation for them to understand what we consider a strategic asset, like it's important that it's... Oh, through you, Madam Chair, certainly that's great feedback that in the um, 
when a submitter goes to submit, we can include background information on what the effect of being a strategic asset is for it so that they understand and we can get feedback on, on that list if that's considered relevant. I think Karen specifically, sorry, Councillor Arms, <laughs> sorry. I think Councillor Arms specifically wants to us to list around the mountain cycle trail in that list now. Through you, Madam Chair, that's a, that's a topic for councillors to debate, and if that's considered something um, to be included in the draft, we can include that. This is just the end, isn't Or should have the ability to quantify services? Yeah. 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 Doesn't have to be a structure, and it needs to be something um, that the local authority needs to maintain to to achieve or promote an outcome the local authority considers as important. It's the best I can go with summarising what's a pretty um, complex definition. Do you mean the overarching idea of significance is? From the council's perspective, it's the significance of issues. Yeah. Um, and then there, it requires by the act to list the strategic assets as a separate business if they are strategic assets. About, it's, it's about how they are dealt with um, in a selling or disposal of those assets. But the, it's, the significance of the government policy isn't just about those strategic assets, it's about anything which is of significance as an issue for the council. Well, the first, the first sentence on page 34, yeah. South District Council has developed a significant engagement policy and that policy will determine the significance of issues within the district. Yeah. And how to align our engagement with the public based on the degree of significance of the issue. And, and, and following on from that, through you, Madam Chair, in the purpose it says to enable the local authority and its communities to identify the degree of significance attached to particular issues, proposals, decisions, or matters. So, and to add to that, it is then the consequences of those issues for the core well beings um, and, and the people in the district. Sorry, sorry, what's Oh, sorry. <laughs> it is a traffic. So, so then the flow on there is that significance um, then relates to the likely consequences for the four well-beings, um, the people in the district, and and this is where the wording came from in the policy: the capacity of the local authority to perform its role um, and the financial and other costs of doing so. Um, I'm just wondering, could any of those duties on Stuart Island be seen as strategic, given rise tax tax for some of them and the effect on life over there, both tourism and commercial and social? It's that, I mean, we have talked about jetties as being as important as roads, haven't we, in terms of Stuart Island, so it would seem that they would appear to be strategic assets if roads go. Yes, I agree. Of course. There's no limiting factors under the Act. Whatever you want to put in there, you put in there. 
So you, you go back to the first sentence on the strategic assets here. It's, it's look, whether an asset is essential to the continued delivery of an outcome that the council considers important for the well being of the community. So it's actually, you know, you started to have those conversations happening around the agendas and feeding that for the island and for the next district. So you will add that in as well. And as the mayor says, the opportunities now, because it's, this is the feedback that. Bring it to the it's true, Madam Chair. I did look at other councils and what strategic assets they include to get a bit of a litmus test. And it is, it, I mean, it, there's there's no homogenous approach, no. <laughs> um, but um, there, you know, the different councils have different priorities. There is some that listed cemeteries. There's some that listed swimming pools. So I don't want to open a can of worms, but it is up to um council to decide what it considers to be strategic so, so would another approach be that we consider all our assets significant unless deemed otherwise i mean wh why do we have it if we don't deem it significant and of course there's various there is a list of priorities but to deem an asset insignificant because that's the opposite to significant it would have a different status in our asset register and, and, and how we prioritize spending on it. Thank you, Madam Chair. The primary reason to list these as strategic is with respect to if you are then having to make decisions with regards to transferring ownership or control of it. So that's when you would look at it differently as a strategic asset to it than just to see it as an asset. Um, so you, and you can't make decisions to transfer ownership of a strategic asset, if it's deemed a strategic asset, unless it's first included in the long term plan. We consider that's the my understanding of that's the primary purpose of why you would classify something from, from a strategic asset perspective in regards to this policy is around its ownership and disposal of, which requires a, from an engagement perspective to have to be dealt with through the outcome. Sometimes it can be consultation with what was designated. So through the chair, we go back to Councillor Douglas, Douglas's comment that we visit all assets in the same way. Through you, Madam Chair, if you did that, then every time you want to see yeah. sell a piece of property, you're going to have to wait till the long term plan to do so. All your halls, everything like that. Even if you've got a wee esplanade, you'll have to wait till the LTP. So through the chair, what, what this is, is um, if, if we go leave it open, as, as has been explained, it leaves us open to putting everything out mm -hmm. for consultation. Mm -hmm. um, but to add on to the list would be easier to do than leave it open. Because the act is quite, sort of, quite specific as to what you can do, and it's as it's been pointed out, it's a modern it's <laughs> 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 homogenous and um and one size does not fit all like you said but the west west coast is totally different to the west coast so yeah. through madam chair i'm hearing if you put the jetties in you just want to specify uh do we own golden bay i don't think we do so it would only be old for island old for island and the other and then you want to put all of them in the strategic assets that's that's a question back to you as council and just clarify, we want to specify the round of the cycle trail. 
not all side controls, just the around the relevant side controls. So I've got jurisdiction on what we're going to do. So that's what I'm saying is if it gets in the amendment, you just plug it in the side controls and then there's other side controls that are mooted that come under such jurisdiction. Where is it? Just so what I'm hearing is specify around the mountain side controls. I think that's because yep. what well, Council Byers referred to it is the, the amount of yep. rack pad money that went into it and therefore justifies it being. Through the chair, I'm not hearing any no for it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the jetties one, are you wanting to just say all jetties or you call them Stuart Island or all jetties or all jetties or Stuart Island? Or, or Stolper Island and stuff. Thank you, Chair. I, I would think in terms of consideration of whether the wharf or wharves in Stewart Islands are a strategic access, the, the issue would be around access. So if you no longer had planes able to fly for some reason, then there must be able to be access. And does that, I mean, I don't know, or what does that mean one, one wharf that's able to operate or two? Answer that question. So in, I think in the example in here is Rosewood Bridge as a whole, the community health as a whole. So is it Stuart Island, Jutty Square as a whole, or is it Stuart Island, Jutty Square? So, so for you, Madam Chair, if you want to, if you, if they become a strategic asset as a whole, and you're only wanting to dispose of one of those five or two of those five, you have to wait for the RTP, next mm. RTP process to go through. Whereas if you want to dispose of little fish or whatever, you, it, um, in between times you can because it's not classified. It is if it's recognised as a whole, but that, those are the, you know, the beginning of yeah. the end of mind, those are the implications of this that have just probably put it out there for consideration. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that, but you can see, no, they need to get shut off. They need to firm up that you're using the airport. There's a whole lawsuit. Where's the activity classified as water structures? Sorry, thank you, Chair. Is this a decision we need to make today? Because the last thing you want is unintended consequences from an immediate discussion. Mm -hmm. In relation to a policy, if it's not required today, can we give some further informed thought to this and come back and make a decision? So you mentioned you know, a, there's a suggestion because you have another crack at this through where it goes to council. Mm. Um, so this is getting feedback from this committee and then put to council and council if you want to then add to your strategic asset list prior to going out for consultation with you at that council meeting. the results of correction to consulting with EWE partners. So I wonder whether we possibly just say it, um, picking a new account feedback provided. Yes. Yes. So can So do we need to add to it? Sorry. So we we have considered the draft significant engagement policy. We have provided feedback and the next natural step is for you to respond to the feedback in order to bring it back to council. So I'm still trying to see clarification from that feedback. What do you want included in, I, I 
think I hear that you want to include it around the mountain cycle trail as a strategic asset, so you can resolve that now. So that's clear. I'm not sure about water structures. I think we've left that to be considered by council, and that will be a decision that council will make at that next next meeting. Through Madam Chair, that's yeah. through the chair up. That's what I'm hearing, and uh, the change to the eel. And for me, it's very clean if it's included in the resolution. Through you, Madam Chair, I guess I'm also, if, if there's any more information that you would like staff to compile that goes into the council report regarding this point, um, we need information on what what that entails. But Mr. Cave, I agree with your suggestion that those are two changes that are explicit and can be listed on the The resolution D is the one I believe that we're looking at at the moment. It considers the draft significance and value of the policy and provides feedback. Now, the feedback provided is that the around the mountain cycle trail will be included as a strategic asset and also the change to the EU recommendation. So that would be included in D. And then we would have E as stands and E as stands. Thank you, Chair. I understood um, from the discussion around the wolves that it would be helpful to have more information around the possible um, the, uh, well, the options, but also the the, the impact yeah. of just a, around the walls we need to know what those what seems to be on the face but there's unintended consequences so uh, uh, more information thank you as you suggested so through you madam chair just to clarify that a wee bit to understand exactly what you're looking for in, in that information um, firstly my first question is it is it about all water structures so you want to consider the pontoons and the and the jetties in Riverton as well as the jetties on Stuart Island. Um, and secondly, what extra information would you want from staff? Um, just so that we know we're getting the right thing. Well you almost just just to answer that um Bay we almost need to as part of this go to the community to find out what they deem was a significant as well, which is the point that I was trying to sort of ask is in relation to what Councillor Menzies said about the E, we do, and we've had that representation review change since this was done. Have we got the community boards in here in the right kind of place for that kind of level of community engagement as well? Through you, Madam Chair, going to the community as part of the consultation mm. board to know here the court that's in there. That's, that's what the recommendation will get. And through you, Madam Chair, just to clarify, not to confuse strategic with significant. If a matter is not listed here, an assessment will be performed, and it could very well be assessed as significant and then entail all the engagement and consultation requirements were it also not listed in the strategic assets. So I don't want to get too hung up on that because that is an LGA requirement that we list those. Yes, there is an impact of having that list, but all things council consider could be assessed as significant and have the same obligations attached to it. So if we get that information that we would want to come back to, is it other considered significant in the wrong way? What's the impact? Okay. Uh, yes, my concern would be if we put on there all the walls in Stewart Island, then we go down the road <laughs> in two months, three months' time, and wanting to do other things, we're constrained mm. in terms of the lengthy process around. So yeah. Through Councillor Lindsay's point, there'll be a, um, a paragraph or two in the report that will take us through 
We can certainly add that information in, but it will be probably repeating what we have just said in terms of the aspect of if it's a strategic, if it's classified as strategic, then the impact is that you can't get, do transfer it or do or sell it or, or dispose of it unless you go through an LTP process. That's that's the listing of the in this in this policy. That's what the um, impact is. Yes. We are asking the part of the consultations we're asking them to look at the policy overall, not just on strategic assets. So it's and I think it's just treated as being significant. The impact of that being what it means on engagement, what the impact of a strategic asset means on how we get that disposal. It's, it's the policy as a whole that we are seeking feedback on from the system that's more subject to approving the recommendations here. That period of thought is only the fourth foreseeable when that period of consultation is proposed. It's clear from a certain life perspective of what One, my chairperson's report. Um, I will move that report and bring up the second. All of you in Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so the purpose of this report is to gain approval from the committee for the SDC holiday program proposal for January 2021, um, and also um, to provide you with a proposal of how the program could be developed um, further beyond this. Um, so both of these proposals are attached um, to this report. Uh, the first one regarding the January 2021 program is much the same um, as it was for the 2020 program. Uh, there just has been a couple of um, locations and dates added um, as requested. Uh, the second proposal 
uh, for developing the program beyond um, this date. Um, includes the business case for the establishment of a new part-time role called the Southland District Active Communities Advisor. So with some increased investment from council, this role will not only deliver uh, the holiday program, but will also work alongside our communities on the provision, improvement and enhancement of play, sports and recreation. So it's proposed that this role uh, be initially put in place for three years and then evaluated. Um, so I'm just going to pass over to Luciana and Michelle now just to give a bit more detail about their proposals. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. So based on, a, on our experience last year, well last year, feels like last year, but it was not last year, beginning of this year, delivering the holiday program, we saw an opportunity to further develop the partnership with Southern District Council and have some dedicated workforce that can work alongside the community to, as Catherine said, to enhance the opportunities for, especially for young people to take part of play, active recreation and sport in the local communities. One of the barriers that many times we identify when it comes to rural communities is transport and, and most, most of the provision of opportunities sometimes are removed from those local communities. But what we believe is that by having a dedicated person working alongside those communities, it can empower local communities to provide more opportunities for especially young people, as I said before, play, engage in active recreation and sport. Yeah, we are not yeah, saying just sport or active recreation for the sake of sport or active recreation. What we strongly believe is that play, sport and active recreation can add huge value to people's lives in, and to communities and that links really nicely to your strategic priorities and uh, community outcomes. Um, so we have a similar role with Gore District Council where we have a part-time role that is based three days in Gore and two days in Invercargill and that what that enables us is to work closely with those stakeholders within Gore District Council, but also leverage from existing contracts that we have with Sport New Zealand and other stakeholders and um, increase the investment and the reach into that district. Uh, so that's basically an overview of, of the role. We think that testing the role for three years and having clear key performance indicators that we could agree as partners could help us evaluate the impact that the role may have in the community and then look at what that could look in the future. Any questions, comments? Sorry, is it the right time just to talk about that business proposal or you would do any other part first? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just wondering in, in respect of the um, the additional funding that you would need to um, for that position. Yeah. Um, presumably that's a extra twenty thousand to fund that role. You say it's part time. What what FTE are you looking at in there? I think ideally we'll be looking at 0.5.6 FTE, especially considering how broad the Southern District is. And also thinking, because it's, this is not just a delivery role, it also involves high level leadership. We think this role needs to be pitched at a level that attracts the right person. So that's why we were pitching it at a 0.5, around 50K plus, and that would include overheads, vehicle, office locations. So is that 50K plus the 30,000? No, 50 50K total. So the 30k that currently the council is investing into the holiday program and an extra 20. For the FTE? Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what you're saying is in, in providing the holiday program you already had a, a, a portion of the FDT allocated yeah. to that and you need to make that to 0.5. Yeah, to and what we think is there's huge value in the holiday program but we believe those $30,000 can be use in a more strategic way if we work alongside those communities and we, we can continue to deliver the holiday program but in a more locally lead way by working alongside those communities which is kind of 
what we tested at the beginning of this year and found those provided within the community. So the, the children that participate in the holiday program can continue to engage in those activities. <laughs> So the holidays, it's a holiday program that's going to run all year. If this, I think that's what, what this role could uh, potentially scope. And if there are communities where the holiday program is needed and there is demand for it, it could potentially, this role could work alongside those communities to make those holiday programs happen. Because the role is a, a, a an annual Role, it's a thousand dollars a year. Yeah, but that fifty it could be a, what we are pitching as a full time, a year round role, but a, a, a part time position. Does that answer your question? Well, the holidays are only for a few weeks, so. Yeah, but what we are saying is it won't, it won't be the, the sole. Um, responsibility and role of this role to run the holiday program and can also be working alongside council staff in terms of how to activate play spaces in playgrounds. It could work alongside local local sport clubs on how to support better the volunteers and increase their participation. It, it won't be it won't be just around the holiday program. It will be looking at all those different play, active recreation and sport opportunities within council. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the purpose of this report was to provide a snapshot of the criteria which each of the nine community boards set for the Community Partnership Fund. Um, so I'll take the report as read. Um, as you can see, uh, boards chose to keep the criteria relatively broad and consider all applications on a case-by-case -case basis, um, which I, I gather if they do decide to change things down the track, they can consider that. But at this stage, they wanted to keep it as broad as possible um, for the community. Um, so far, we've had four of our boards have their first closing round, so we've received 36 applications in total so far. Um, and... Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Um, I just noticed that none of the boards have mentioned retrospective funding, and I'm just wondering what the feeling would be about that. I, it was my understanding our previous community initiatives didn't allow retrospective funding, and it is the normal situation for granting organisations to have that stipulation. Um, so I'm just interested whether it's a, whether that's been intentional to leave that out or whether it's been an over
recite or just what the view might be about that? Through you, Madam Chair, uh, it was not something that was raised with the boards that I was dealing with in particular and when I spoke to the, um, my colleagues, this similar situation. However, if that is something that you want consideration into, we can definitely go back to those boards and seek clarification around whether that is a criteria that they want to list. Sorry, through the chair, but it's their criteria. Mm. And I under, my understanding is that they're case by case um, application, so it would be up to the, no disrespect, I don't think we should be poking and nosing at the site on this criteria. Because these aren't the same, they're all different, so they've obviously put a bit of thought into it. Well, not the modernists. If I may, I just, in my experience, it can be a tricky area to get into because a precedent is created that then everyone else expects the same type of thing. So it's an area to be cautious with. And it promotes, you know, it uh, certainly puts the, um, increases the importance to the organisations that are doing the planning right for the people that get that far. Sorry, just one um, recommendation here is that we receive the report. Do we want to say, I certainly wouldn't be voting against it because of that, but I just think it's something to play. Yeah. So, so the, it's an issue that needs clarification, that's for sure. So through the chair, we're, all we're doing is receiving this report. Um, and if the councillors want to offer some advice to their beautiful chairs. Kiora, Tina Koto Katoa, um, Chair Case, Mayor Tong, and Councillors. Um, I'll take it that this report's been read and would just perhaps make a couple of comments. Um, Catlins as a tourism destination does span the two council boundaries and visitors to the area don't really know or maybe actually don't even care um, that they are co uh, crossing council boundaries. And so this is one of the reasons why the partnership group was formed to enable some consistency when you're traveling through the Catlins. Um, it ensures that there's a collaborative and cross-boundary approach. Um, key stakeholders, as I've listed, that are represented on the group are Great South, Clutha Development, Clutha District Council, the Department of Conservation, Awarua Rananga, Catlins Coast, South Catlins Charitable Trust, Chair Pam York represents the Waihokai Toi Toi Community Board, and Councillors Keist and Duffy and myself represent South and District Council. Post-COVID, as part of the government's strategic tourism assets protection program, uh, regional tourism organisations were able to access funding, acknowledging the important role that they play um, in supporting the tourism system. And the intent was that they would lead and coordinate activities alongside the tourism industry, stakeholders, iwi and communities. Both Great South and Clutha Development submitted plans which were successful to uh, receive funding. Um, one thing that has been quite disappointing for our local promotion groups is that their funding is not available uh, for their use. Um, and we have received a bit of feedback from our um, promotion groups. 
The investment plan for the Catlins is split into the three categories, domestic marketing, industry capacity and product development and destination management. Um, the sustainable Catlins project is also a priority for this investment plan. It represents a desire to identify how to develop, manage and promote the Catlins as a sustainable destination. Um, it does acknowledge as well that there are economic opportunities from tourism for the community, but that this must be balanced and achieved alongside environmental, cultural and social considerations. And that's really, really important to our communities in the Catlins. Um, it's important that our council is part of this uh, partnership group because strong relationships with the various stakeholders are essential in achieving the vision of the Catlins tourism strategy for the benefit of our communities in the Catlins. Happy to take any questions. It's not a question, but I'd just like to acknowledge um, Karen Perdue's participation in that group. It's been very useful. Thank you. portion of funding that uh, enables Great South to be part of that, or is it solely funded through Mungu? Um, I think it's just the, it's part of our agreement with Great South um, to um, be involved in this sort of stuff. So I guess in that way, it is it is our portion that we're using. Yep. So I, I see some that you can suggest. Not to that part of it. So they are, so through the chair, they are our regional tourism organisation. Yep. And I know Bobby Brown's been on that organisation for some time, and she's had a number of um, cat fights in Catlins over the last 10 years to try and get things organised. And I'm so pleased to see this actually proceeding. The only question I've got is the um, inclusion of both Otago Rinnea in this. They're not, not involved in any way. Just interesting. Um, yeah, I just had a question really in regard to the entry and exit points of the Catlins being like probably in reality Dunedin and Invercargill. Um, has there been thoughts of connection with with those places of entry and exit points? Yeah. That's just what I thought when I read it. Yes. So through you, Madam Chair, um, there has been some work done um, about extending the actual um, uh, partnership in terms of making it a trail, you know, from Dunedin down, um, coming through the Catlins and uh, to Invercargill. There has been some um, discussion about that. But there's certainly a lot of work to be done just in what we're doing. So, um, and a lot of the projects that are listed to be developed under this um, funding are quite extensive and large projects. Thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, there's the 45, <laughs> south, 45 south project yes. that Great South's driving with the other is it six or so RDOs yep. in the, from the Waitaki South. That's right. So, that's an area I think from Council Fraser that we can incorporate yep. that. Of the conversation in with that yep. East by South project, as well as yep. the work that this partnership is doing as well. That's right. Yeah. Yep. 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 Thank you, and I'm making it.
designed to give a snapshot of what's happening in our communities and our district as a whole and offers us an opportunity to compare how we're doing at a national level and also compare us against other territorial authorities nationally. Um, we work with several organisations who are helping us with and also providing data to us on a regular basis such as Solgum and Bill and more recently have got on board with Drop Loves Data who are actually able to provide us with information down to an area unit level. Um, this report is proposed to be presented on a quarterly basis for information purposes and at a later time after seeing shifts and trends we can use this information to shape our future direction and decision making. Um, I'm really keen for some feedback around the information provided in the report and in particular if there's anything the committee would like information on that's currently not in the report. We've got lots of data streams and sources available to us so it's possible that future reports could look a bit different than needed. I'm happy to take any questions. There were a couple of things in this particular report which was from census data and they will be unlikely to change and possibly won't be in future reports until we get that new data. Yes. One of the things that the staff is able to do is they re forecast on an annual basis, I think. So Annually, there could be the reforecast of um, population, but that will be more at the total level rather than the breakdown level. That's right. Yeah. Um, thank you for the report. It's, um, it's nice to see it snapshot it in a visual way. Um, I would be quite interested in kind of the next stage on, like, for example, some things which pop out are like the households with no internet access. Um, being higher than the national average and that is a real problem for a range of reasons including like COVID response stuff and the number of stuff you know that came out online versus other formats and things and so I'd be quite keen to see like the next level of what are we are we are there any projects happening in the region to address some of those things because I know there probably are some things happening in that space um, so kind of where there's outliers if you, what else is going on or if nothing's happening, then it kind of signals to us that maybe something does need to happen. Um, I was quite impressed to see the number of businesses in comparison to the population was quite outstanding, I thought, um, quite a large number. Um, and just with the population breakdown and the ages, it would be good to have that as percentages as well as numbers. So um, just a preference to compare, and particularly, obviously it's not going to be available quarterly, but year by year as, or, or well, three yearly, However, often we get census data, but um, that will be quite interesting to see the change over time. Like a lot of the other stats are showing changes happening. Um, that would be good to see how the mix of population in different areas is changing over time. So through you, Madam Chair, as this progresses, we will be able to provide quite detailed analysis of this as we progress over time. So we'll certainly be able to turn it over to you for that. A lot of the information that Drop Loves Data provides us is actually updated on a monthly basis. Mm. So especially around those housing shifts um, and that data there, that's a monthly basis provided to us. So we can catch up with that data as we can. Um, thank you. A very useful report. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking about the um, the implications of COVID locally and particularly in terms of unemployment. And if there's an opportunity, maybe not every quarter, but I, I would quite like to understand 
where that is in terms of our communities and also the age. So to understand whether um, there's, um, that we see a, a greater impact on our young people, for example, and, and then we can think about where we might um, need to support through, through council in ways that we might be able to support. Thank and you. for information they don't send through to us already, we're really flexible in terms of providing additional information through Council. Mm. Um, the benefits dashboard has already given us a little blip in terms of what's happening with COVID. And they yes. also have some specific COVID impact reports as well around what's happening with things like spend, mm. measuring the effects of COVID, um, analysing cases and spread, and also the vulnerability to the outbreak across the region as well. So there is, mm. there's a lot more information available to us than what we have in this report. Yes. Show you at any time if you want to know. And it's a moving feast, I understand as well. Yeah. Thank you. Just looking at your DDI figures, um, it's interesting that um, in Southland, adults with no qualification is higher than the average, which is um, on the face of it perhaps not a good thing. But I think if you drill down, you would find that there are a lot of very well qualified people in other areas that are doing very well without formal qualifications. And not just in the rural sector, but in other trades and that as well. And so, although it's just an indicator, it has to be taken in context. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I was wondering if it would be worthwhile giving some statistics around mental health and depression, given that we're talking about well-being, and sort of related to that, I also wondered if it might be worthwhile giving an understanding around how much time per day people are spending on watching TV and internet being typed on the screen. On their phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right, it's now they tell you. Mm. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what everyone says. It's great report, mm. um, really useful information. Um, just on context, what Councillor Douglas said on the vehicle stats, I think a lot of those farm vehicles are saying there's only one ATV, but I think that's because it was registered, so I mean, there's probably a whole lot that have been registered. <laughs> um, Same with tractors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just, a bit of context around that, but yeah, just saying that's what you do. It's a little bit like road miles. Yeah. Um, just on the um, uh, DDIs, just with those graphs, um, I just find it a wee bit confusing, like the households with damp and mould. Um, does that 14 out of 67 mean we rank the best for that? So there's or? 13 that are better than we are. Okay. And then when you go to the households with no vehicle access, and we're uh, ranked a high four out of 67, that means that we've got a higher rate of vehicles. Then. There are three that are doing better than we are already. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So many more vehicles than people. Yeah, yeah that's what I was wondering. Actually. I thought it was an interesting um, stat in terms of what's it, what is it telling us. Mm. Means we're not in a condensed area. Um, so obviously these stats have come from a source. Is there like a whole lot of things you can just pull out? I mean, I just really have a whole lot of different. Is there a summary of all those things? Like, is there a page that kind of says what they're like? Just out of interest, because this might be something that we've never even thought of. Um, just picked a few out. Is there an easy way to see what's all there? Um, yes and no. Yes, through Dot Loves Data. Yeah. There, I can quite easily give you information in terms of what they can provide, but through lots of other sources and what Statistics New Zealand can provide, and we can get through other providers, there's, it's kind of unlimited, really, at this stage. And we can make many approaches to other organisations for data who can provide it to us. So, yes and no. Yeah. Feedback. Um, we start with the feedback. 
um, can someone move the conversion on the channel four that we will teach later this week? Um, that's good. Yeah, Carla Kiora, Chair Keast, Mayor Tong, and Councillors, um, I will take this report um, as read and perhaps make a couple of comments. Um, this report from the Centre for Social uh, Impact was carried out across the Tangata Whenua community and volunteer sector in May and June of 2020. Um, COVID-19 has had a widespread impact um, on those groups and organisations throughout lockdown and beyond. COVID-19 challenged funding access, staff continuity and service delivery. Despite this, the sector rallied, adapted, moved with agility and in many cases did a lot more with a lot less. The survey highlighted some clear strengths and service adaptability within and across organisations. Uh, unlocking a previously unknown capacity for flexibility and innovation, being responsive, nimble, adaptive and resourceful, and appreciation of technology as a powerful tool, I think we all discovered Zoom, um, the extent to which COVID-19 revealed the strengths and capabilities of teams and organisations, the immense value of working together and the huge appetite for collaboration within the not-for-profit sector. A substantial majority of organisations experienced or were experiencing a reduction in funding as a result of COVID-19. Most of the organisations that participated, however, have funds or operational funding in reserve to enable some continuity to weather the COVID storm. For some, however, their position is clearly precarious without ongoing funding. When asked to indicate the impacts of COVID-19 on the level of services, a majority of participants indicated they had cut back on service delivery. Reasons for this included social distancing restrictions, restrictions on events or large gatherings, closing or halting operations during lockdown and reduced income. Increased community need was a key driver for increasing service delivery in some organisations. One response stated they went from helping 20 families prior to lockdown to 80, for example, during lockdown. Participants noted the most common challenges of COVID-19 were meeting the needs of the people they were supporting, ensuring sufficient revenue to maintain viability, ensuring staff and volunteers were well supported, developing new service offerings, changing service provisions to meet public health criteria and meeting the levels of work required. Dealing with financial uncertainty, managing the impacts of this uncertainty on service delivery and organisational viability were the most prominent priorities or concerns. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, Participants were generally optimistic about the continuity and future of the organisations. The five most needed areas of support identified were fundraising, marketing and communication, digital technology, innovation and strategic advice, grant writing and more volunteers. These responses indicated there remained significant gaps in the available and funded resourcing for community organisations to deliver core services. The most commonly needed changes selected by the participants to strengthen the sector into the future were collaboration between organisations and funding to cover salaries and operational costs. And you will know that um, covering salaries and operational costs is excluded from many funding um, organisations. Other areas of strengthening included sector-wide leadership to provide voice and influence, access to information, data in one place, 
strengthening governance knowledge and skills in the sector and strengthening financial management knowledge and skills. Some of the lessons from our COVID-19 lockdown experience uh, include the importance of responsiveness and flexibility and being open to new ways of working. Participants also mentioned significant advances in information technology capability and the value that was generated by these changes. Many reflected on the extent to which COVID-19 revealed the strengths of teams and organisations, a common theme. COVID-19 also <coughs> appeared to be a powerful catalyst for relationship building and cross-sector collaboration. High trust models of funding, flexibility and mutual respect between local and central government, government philanthropy and the sector created the conditions for some stunning outcomes for the communities across Aotearoa. Many people came together in our Southland communities to be of service to others and helped their community to stay connected, get well, stay well, and showed much generosity, kindness and compassion. Much was achieved when we came together for a common good, and I think we can be really proud of our people in their place. Our next steps will be working with our communities and organisations as they look to reshape their future through the ongoing challenges of COVID-19. Um, happy to take questions. And through you, Madam Chair, um, there's an app being um, developed by some um, very talented young woman at Wat Wakatipu High School, which actually um, uh, you can register as a volunteer um, on their app and, uh, pe and people can register volunteer opportunities and you can get matched through the app. Um, and this is something that we are uh, looking into at the moment uh, because it's a very um, easy way, I guess, to, if you've got some time to volunteer, you can look up and see what might be available. Exactly. Yeah. Um, just to follow on, I was at the meeting with Volunteer South and they have a web-based version of exactly that thing. So right. um, it would probably be good if, and they have a centrally central presence, so it's probably a good thing um, to databases and to yeah. lots of places may not be as useful as one. Yeah. Um, there was, I would say, 20 to 25 people at that meeting, mostly would be intercargo based. Yeah. Um, the thing I noticed, um, the national organisations probably faring better than the small organisations. Yeah. Um, so I can think of some small organisations that haven't fitted with any criteria and don't have the national capacity to apply for funding, who are now not able to pay staff. Um, whereas a national organisation like I work for, it's all, you know, you've got the people and the capacity to kind of continue yeah. that. Um, so I think yeah, some of our very small organisations are probably going to be the ones that are going to be looking at some really big suffering and that will be affecting communities. And probably around events and stuff, there's probably gonna be some really, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I run an event and we lost three grand. Um, it's three grand, it's not the end of the world, but there's people that will not continue with events and stuff because of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's gonna be a really um, key sector. And, but as far as volunteer numbers, honestly, throughout COVID, coming across my desk every day was people volunteering, we ended the lockdown with about 60 people on our list wanting to volunteer with us. The irony is that, of course, because of COVID, we had no clients coming, so um, we don't actually need them. Um, but yeah, there's certainly, we saw a significant increase in people wanting yeah. to volunteer. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's pick up with those questions. Yeah, I'll just say that if there are those community organisations or whether it's event based stuff, whatever, that, that are, that are seeing a bit of pressure 
The next one of the things from a council rule perspective, you are able to repair the two way from the anchor box system yeah. Yeah. Um, and utilize and access that human resource to work alongside them to see. We look, from a volunteer perspective, we do like what Corn South's doing with the, yeah. the innovate, but the yeah. UI security liaison office is doing that to be a part of yeah. mm. what we are doing that for you. So yeah. I just encourage, from an elected yeah. member's perspective, be the eyes and ears of the community to bring that connection back to yeah. the mm. primarily the first thing that can be done. Any through you, Madam Chair, I think um, one of the other things that's really important to realise in uh, the context of South and District is that um, talking to some of our other stakeholders, there's a lot of organisations that actually weren't going that well before COVID. Um, and um, it has highlighted the fact that we have a lot of organisations that are essentially doing the same thing. They're working in the same space. And um, talking to some of our other stakeholders, um, we see that as an opportunity to perhaps um, look at, um, because funding opportunities are less, that we probably need to consolidate um, some of the organisations that are operating um, along the lines that Councillor Fraser mentioned um, as well, that um, we're, yeah, there's a lot of people out there doing the same thing. Um, and it might be more effective if we um, could work alongside a, a bigger organisation that can develop some of the resourcefulness and the resources that you need to be really, really effective. So that that has been a learning, I guess, out of COVID, um, but we shouldn't forget that some of them weren't actually going that well before COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just coming to the volunteers, did you see the young lady, 10-year-old girl in the town tower and her grandmother walk 20 kilometres to the town town care <laughs> Dirty bags of rubbish. Yeah. Is there any issue? <laughs> well, I don't go that way. Dirty bags of rubbish. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Very Thank you, Nami. Thank you. Moving on to 8.7 on page 89, community wellbeing, future issues, overview. I'll take the point of where, um, I think probably that just goes without saying, a significant flavour there around COVID-19 impact, significant flavour there around refunds. Um, and some of the topical issues that are coming through, just the positivity of the structure around agriculture, challenges around tourism and uh, the challenges, but recognition of the need of migrant uh, being the sort of the themes I think that have sort of become through that particular website. And I hope to be you know, they were listening to your conversation with them and kind of what they were really you're interested in.
that you can't break the rules. That number 11 was um, number 10, 11. People that can raise the report suggested that local government, or maybe it could be central government, rather than local government, taking the lead and working with communities. Unless local government moves quickly to make the neighbouring community government of central the way it works. Yeah. It's pretty hard picking, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and that's the, that's the conversation that's currently happening nationally that I've been involved with with Solver and LPD. But I don't know the need for local government to actually take a front foot lead approach in this, otherwise it will if it's not delivering what is required at that local community or at that local level, then it will be slowed up in some form or other potentially. And so when I was in Rome a couple of weeks ago, that was exactly the conversation. That's what I was talking to Rome Royal about next week is is that local government reform needing to be part of that conversation, otherwise yeah, it will be absorbed in some other form which could be quite difficult. So and, and Peter McKinley's well known for being quite controversial. And, but, and hard hitting, but actually very often on the button. Another good article we just put out about three years ago, just so I can find it, send the link to it as well, in terms of some of the longer term implications related to potential implications for local government. Mm. That might be, you know, that Peter's put an article out that, that might be interesting. Yeah. Um, I assume that you know, most of the people that Involved in developing the group education and work over years and they ensure that we are educating them in the next level. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, probably too, the cost-wise, you know, I live remotely, um, in order for us to have had internet, we were on farm side um, for many years, and for us it cost six to eight hundred dollars a month to have a VPN between our marine business and our home, and our home, because of the hill that cut off the internet access, so now we have set up our own satellite, um, and we're using a company from Australia called Unifine in order to get internet unlimited at $131 a month. So for some families, paying the sort of money we were paying is just way out of their reach. And we have to have a fair opportunity to, but I agree with you, we have got to have a fair opportunity to um, have access to study. And I don't know how we get that balance and how we offer it to everyone in Southland, but it was unaffordable for us to cut the kids' time. <laughs> Often. <laughs> oh, just the reference to agriculture keeping on going in that 117, which it certainly did and it was wonderful. But this coming season, I mean, there's talk of land being down 30 to 40 days, uh, dollars per head because of the high end cuts not having a market during the, due to COVID and other overseas and also hearing a lot of farmers it's actually losing ten thousand dollars a year and what it costs them to produce the wool to what they're getting for it so our economy here in southland might not be as rosy next year on that basis and the slink skin industry is completely gone probably forever so yeah i mean we've been really good so far but it might not you know, that flat deering looks okay but and again, that you know, we are very much dependent on the rainfall, so while it's a very difficult to see when selling that stuff off cheap, but when it's got to go up and down that way, it's so expensive. I think it's because you know, it's the point you need to be getting the value of it back up again once we've sold it to you. So it's just a really difficult one. Which is a very good reason why councils should use it in their buildings. The wall, the wall, the wall, the yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, the wall, the wall too. We should also wear it. And the cost of but, compliance uh, going forward is huge for mum. The cost of compliance going forward is, mm. is huge what's in front of us. So. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So ending on a positive note, thank you for your report. <laughs> and the opportunity to link into the other thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.